Okay, it wasn't recording. I didn't start it. Damn. All right. Well, anyway. <clears throat> okay. So let me just back up. So so we went over the first problem. We showed how to change these from SOP to POS. And um, and so we used the second distributive law. The first thing we did, we inspected to see if we could eliminate terms and we could eliminate these two. And then we used the second distributive law and we came up with this B plus CD. In this one, we did the same thing. We combined these two terms uh, using theorem nine and W X Y plus uh, uh, W. Yeah. Uh, you're no longer showing the paper sheet. Oh, thank you. Yeah, man, I'm screwing up by the numbers. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. All right. All right. So hopefully we can make this work now. Um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, so let me just re review. We, we did this already. So the first problem was um, A. Uh, let me just, maybe I'll just print that out again. Make it easy. Okay. So I'll work this problem again. So the first thing you do whenever you have one of these problems, and there's going to be two of these on the test, okay? The first thing you do is you, you um, and let me get, make this bigger. Okay, so so it's, so it's here we want to go from the, the POS form to the SOP form. So here it is in POS, A plus B plus C prime quantity times B plus C plus D prime quantity times C prime plus B. And yeah, okay. And uh, so the first thing we do, we try and use theorems 9, 10, 11, or the consensus theorem to eliminate terms. Now, the consensus theorem is pretty hard, so don't worry about that. So in this case, can, can we combine any terms? Well, no, that doesn't look like we can. Can we, uh, can we eliminate a term using the x plus, uh, plus y? quantity times X, can we eliminate this term? And the answer is yes. We have a C prime plus B here. And here we have a C prime plus B here, plus an A. So this term can be eliminated. And then, <clears throat> then we, have, we have B plus C plus D prime, and we have C prime plus B. Because we have a B in both of these, and a C prime here, and a C plus D prime here, this C can be eliminated. Now, the, that's theorem 11. The reason we can do that is if, if B is 1, then, then this is already reduces to 1. 1 or C or D prime times C prime or 1 is 1. So if B is 1, we're done. If B is 0, then, uh, then if C prime is 1, then C would be 0. So so then this term is going to depend on D prime. If on the other hand, uh, C, is, C is one and C prime is zero, this and B is also zero, this term will be zero. And then it doesn't matter what C, D is, zero times whatever is always going to be zero. So this C doesn't add anything to this term. Because if C prime is one and B is zero, then we're, then then this is going to be zero and it's going to depend on D prime. But if C prime is zero, this term will be, and B is zero, then this time will, will be zero and it won't matter what this term is anyway. So C doesn't add. So because of that, we can get rid of C. Now we're just left with B plus D times C prime plus B. But let's say we forgot that and we couldn't do that. So we'll, because we have a C prime and a C, we could use the maternal, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, multiplying and factoring theorem. But because we really could drop C, it's better not to use that one. It's better to use second distributive law. And so we'll do, we'll do, we have a B and a B. So we'll let X equals B and we'll let um, Y, Z, we'll let Y be C plus D prime and Z be C prime. And then you'll see the C will drop out anyway. So let's write that. So remember the second distributive law here is X plus 
yz equals uh, x plus y quantity times x plus z quantity. So we'll just, we're gonna apply it in this direction. And again, the b is y. So now we're just gonna have a b plus yz. So that's gonna be b plus, and the, the y we said was c d prime, c plus d prime. times C prime, the Z. Now, when we multiply the C prime in here, this is just gonna be B plus C prime C plus C prime D prime. Well, this term drops because C prime and C are always zero and together. And so then we're just left with B plus C prime D prime. All right. Then this one, same thing. We inspect it to see what we can do. So can we apply theorem nine, 10, or 11? Well, we have a W X Y. We have a X prime Y Z. We have a W X prime Y. So W X Y and W X prime Y. So the X changes so we can combine these into W Y. Now we have a W Y. In this term, we have W X prime Y Z prime, which you can rewrite W y x prime z prime so now you have a w y so this whole term can drop because of this w y and now we're just left with w y plus this term x prime y z now we have a y in both terms so we can use the second distributive law again only in the other direction okay and um so so we'll let the y will be x so now we're just going to have we're, it's going to wind up with, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I, I did this the last time too. We're going to factor the y out, my bad. So that's just going to be, we're going to use the first distributive law and factor out the y. y is w times the quantity w plus uh, x prime z. Now we're going to use the second distributive law with w being x, x prime being y, and z being z. And so then that's just going to be y times the quantity w plus x prime times the quantity w plus z. And that's the final answer there. That's in, S, that's in POS form. And this is in SOP. So we went from POS to SOP. And here we went from SOP to POS. Always do everything you can at the beginning. It will make your life better. Okay, then this problem is very straightforward. Remember, number all the boxes, right? So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, skip, switch the rows, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Remember, all these rows line up the same. You number the rows 0, 1, to, but you don't even need the numbers because if you just remember the four bit hex, all these are like one, zero, zero, one, that's eight, one, zero, zero, one, that's nine, and so forth. So then you can make sure you can also go one, two, three, four, and put a line one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So let's do this one. I'm going to leave out the zeros one, one, x, zero, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, zero, and x, zero, one, x. Okay. Now, the problem, uh, if we, so let's first look at the prime implicants. It doesn't ask us that, but let's do it anyway. Um, so here's, here's a row. That's great. And then you can loop these two. That's great. And then you, can loop these two. But you can also loop this one like this. So the, and then, you, then you can do this one. And you can also do around, you can include that one. Now, you don't need these necessarily. So you probably don't want those. And, uh, and then it's, let me move it up. Sorry, so you can see it really well. So, so we have so what do we have? So we have one, two, three, the wraparound four, five, 
and six. We have six prime implicants. Let me just count them again. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Six PIs. Of those, which ones, where are, the, where are there ones that are only covered by a single term? Well, he, well, this one is only covered by this group. And this one and this one are only covered by this group. All the rest of them have multiple coverage. So they're two essential PIs. And then there's, then, so there's four non-essential. And of the four, we only have to pick, so this one and this one, the only one that's not covered is this one. The others are don't care, so we don't have to worry about them. And we have two different ways to cover this one. So we have two minimum solutions that are not identical. And, uh, and so, so after we pick our two essentials, we only have to pick one more of the non-essentials. Can't, this one won't help. This one won't help, but, but you can either pick this one or you can pick the wraparound. Okay, now we're supposed to do the SOP solution. So what I usually do is I copy this over, uh, go up a little bit. I usually copy this over to the uh, to another map so I can see the zeros. When you do that, always copy, the, always copy the don't cares too. So so here are the so so here's a zero, here's a don't care. Then these are all ones. This is another zero. This is a don't care. That's a zero here. And then we have zeros here, a don't care here, a zero here, a zero here. That's a one. That's a one. Uh, so yeah, so that's it. So, so there should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we should have counted them. We should check over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we should have counted the ones and the don't cares too. There's one, two, three don't cares, one, two, three. So that should, should be good. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six ones. Okay. So now when you look at this, what do you see? Well, we can circle these, we can circle this, and then we can do this little thing here. That covers, that covers all of the zeros. We could also do one here, but we don't need that. So I'm gonna leave it out. So there's my solution. Now, how do I read these off? Well. I pretend they're ones. If they're ones, this would be, if we do A, B, C, D, this would be C, D. But that makes it C prime plus D prime when we invert it. And then this one would be A, C prime, but that makes it A, that makes it A prime plus C. And then this group would be, uh, would be B, uh, if, if they were ones, it would be B, C prime, D prime. So that makes this one B prime plus C, plus, uh, no, no prime, plus C plus D. So our final answer then is B prime plus C plus D times A prime plus C times C prime plus D prime. That's the POS solution. And there's only one, one minimum solution for that one. Okay, now let's go back to the... Uh, to the VHDL code. So uh, I'm gonna look at this here because we have it all set up over here. See if we have any new people waiting. Nope, nobody waiting. All right. All right, here's, here's the VHDL code. So if you look at this, it's, a, it's, a, it's VHDL code and it's a VHDL code it has an entity that says flip-flop and the port list is D clock clear and set not in and Q and Q prime out. So it looks a lot like a D flip-flop already. And then here's the architecture using this entity, this port list. So and architecture flip-flop dash A and a flip-flop is, and then there's an internal signal temp, which is a standard logic. And then we have this process block right here. The process block then goes to here and and it has this sensitivity list that when these signals change, it triggers the execution of the process block. 
That's what makes this a sequential block. It's, it's triggered on signal changes. Uh, whereas a continuous assignment uh, is, always, is always updating. These two lines down here are continuous assignments. Anytime temp changes, Q and Q prime will be updated. Q will equal temp and Q prime will equal the inverse of temp. So if temp's one, Q will be one, Q prime will be zero. That way Q and Q prime will always be the opposite, which is what they're supposed to be. Now, anytime clock, set not or clear changes, this, uh, this, this block will execute. And so uh, notice that we have uh, set, uh, a set not, so it's active low. And you can see that it, when set not equals zero, then temp is set to one. The clear, on the other hand, is active high. When clear is one, then temp is assigned zero. So, so these signals work opposite. Now that's unusual. Normally, if you if the set's uh, active low, the clear probably would be two. And it's uh, particularly if you're programming an FPGA, uh, it's usually costly to first. You, they don't want you to have a set and a clear. They want you to only have one of them. And if you do have both, you, they definitely don't want you to have them working opposite, polar, uh, opposite polarity. In the Xilinx FPGAs, they actually prefer you make them, uh, make them active high and not active low. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> OK. And then the clock, let's look at the clock. Clock, else if clock tick event and clock equals 0. So clock tick event is an idiom in Verilog, uh, sorry, in VHDL, that means that the clock just changed. And clock equals zero means it's now zero. So if it changed, if it just changed and the clock is now zero, then it must have fallen from one to zero. So that's a falling edge clock. All right, so we have a falling edge clock, an active low set, and an active high clear. So armed with that, then we should be able to answer the questions. And here they are. What kind of flip-flop does the code show? Well, obviously a D. How many bits can this remember? So it's, that's not a trick question. I, it's kind of an obvious question. So how many bits can a flip-flop remember? Every flip-flop can remember one bit. Q is either zero or one. And of course, Q prime will be the opposite, but that doesn't give you an additional bit because it's, it's, it's linked totally to Q. So it's, nothing, it's not anything additional. Uh, <clears throat> What do we call clock, clear, and set not in the first line? We call those the sensitivity lists. Okay. Is the clock rising or falling edge? The, the clock is a falling edge, so it should have a bubble. Label the two blanks. Well, this, this is the D input, and this would be the clear. The clear does not have a bubble, but we should have drawn a bubble. So add bubbles as needed. Well, you'd put a bubble on the set not, and you put a bubble on the, on the active low clock to indicate correctly what they are. And then uh, if clear is zero, set not as zero, Q equals what? All right, so, so remember that the, the clear is active high, right? We already, oops, let's see, we have to look here. If the clear is one, then it clears temp. If the set is zero, then it sets temp. And if, ne and if neither one of those are active, then it checks the clock. All right, well, so what's the story here? So um, if clear is zero and set not as zero, so clear is not gonna be active because it's active high and it's low. So that will, it will be inactive. But set not is active low and it's low, so therefore, the output for Q is going to be one. So that's the answer for that. All right. So moving on. OK, so let me get the next page. Oh, I think I did already. Is this it? Yeah. OK. So, so let me expand this a little bit. All right, so okay, so compute the following. I don't know. Um, 
the a bit tooth complement of 33 decimal. All right, so we'll do this. So 33 divided by two is uh, 16 remainder one. Two into 16 is eight remainder zero. Two into eight is four remainder zero. Two into four is two remainder zero. Two into two is one remainder zero. Two into one is zero remainder one. So our number is going to be start with a low bit. It's going to be one zero 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 one. That's the higher order bit. That's the lower order bit. And let's check it. So this is uh, this is one two four eight sixteen and thirty two. So this is 32 plus 1, that's 33. So that makes total sense. All right, so now we have the positive, positive 33 equals 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Now notice that higher order bits of 1. So if that were 2's complement, it'd already be negative. So obviously, we have to pad it out to 8 bits. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 with zeros. And now we can invert it. Copy bits so you get to the first one, copy that, invert everything else. So we copy the one, and then we get one, 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 zero, one, one. One, 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 zero, one, one. And that is minus 33 in two's complement. Okay, don't forget to pad it out. Uh, all right, then we have a multiplication. All you do is repeat these. So this is one, zero, 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 one. Then you have zeros. And then you have this again, one, zero, 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 one. Then you add up your partial products and you get one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Okay. And here you're gonna subtract. So one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. So one from zero, you can't do that. So now you have to borrow. So you, uh, my pen's too big to do this easily. But you, you borrow this one, so that makes a zero there, and you put a two here. Now you borrow one from that two, that puts a one there and a two here. And then a one and a two, and a one and a two, and a one and a two. And I don't know if we did it the right number of times, but then you subtract the one from the two and you get a one. Then zero from one is one, zero from one is one, one from one is zero, zero from one is one, and one from zero, and, um, and one from one is zero and top of the zero. So that's how that works. All right. So given the K map, answer the following loop the terms for the minimum solution. And then, okay, so obviously minimum solution is this. Consensus term is all four. And you'd have to add the consensus term if you had a hazard. Hazards are when you come from this circle to this circle, basically, or from specifically from that box to this box. And if you put in the consensus term, which is this, then it fixes it because this consensus term is only uh, uh, CD. And it doesn't even have the, the B variable that gets changed between these two groups. All right. So you also have to think about the downstream logic. If the downstream logic is fast, then glitches matter. The downstream logic is really slow. Glitches probably don't matter. OK, let's look at this problem. So if you can see it all here, I may have to raise this up just a little bit. So, so I'll probably just go into the into the uh, office hours a little bit, although I, well, there'll probably be some micro and DSD people joining us to get help. So I may not. I'll go a little bit in. All right, we'll see how much we can get through here. Sequential circuit has an input X and output Z. The output's the same as what the input was two clock cycles earlier. See example data, complete the state table. Note when specifying previous inputs, the order is two clock cycles ago, one clock cycle ago. So the previous input, so zero one means that's two clock cycles, that's the last one. 
All right. <coughs> All right. So first is it a million or more? Well, you can look at the output and you can see that because we have the output depends on X, it's a more. I mean, it's a million. So it's a million. So we'll circle that. Here's our example sequence. So, so two clock cycles ago. So we assume the output's been zeros back here. Uh, so we don't really know. But so here, obviously, it's a zero. Here it's a zero. Here it's a zero. Now this is two clock cycles ago. So that's a one, then a zero, then a one, then a one, then a zero. So that's how that works. OK, so we have to remember two inputs. OK, so we start here and we assume that we have two zeros. If we get a zero, we're just going to stay here and we're still going to output a zero because that's the last one. If we get a one, then we'll go here and now our, our last one will still be one, zero, but our most recent one will be one. And it, from here, if we get another one, then we're going to go to S3 and then we'll remember two ones. If on the other hand, we get a zero, we'll go to S2 and we'll remember uh, that our most recent one's a zero, but this one will slip, shift back. And so now we'll, we'll be one zero like that. All right. Now, when we go here, we're still going to output a zero, but we're going to go on a one. When we go here, we're going to go on a zero, but we're going to out and we'll output that zero because that's the two clock cycles ago. When we go here, we're going to go there on a one and output a zero. Then from here, if we get a zero, then we're going all the way back to here and we're going to output a one because our two clock cycles previous was a one. And if we get a, uh, a one, then we're going to go here and we'll output a one. From this one, if we get a uh, zero, then we're going to be zero one. So we're going to go here on a zero and we'll output a one. And if we get a one, we'll just stay here and output the one. Now we have two paths under every node, and so we're done. Now we can just extract this. In. Go ahead, question. Hi, uh, so my question is, are we just assuming or is there a rule for the state graph? Uh, there, it, the state graph isn't a plug and chug thing. You kind of just have to figure it out. So it's really, it's really you solving the problem. So you get a problem description, and then you have to come up with a way to, to, to do it. Uh, and so you, that's where you just kind of have to think it through. So the idea then is you start with S0 and you say, okay, what do I have in S0? Well, in this particular case, I'm assuming the two previous inputs were zero. And then, uh, then if I get a zero, what should I do? Well, I'll stay here because now that my two previous inputs will still be zero. But if I get a one, my previous inputs will be zero one. So I need a node that remembers that. And okay. basically, if you think of this, each node remembers something different. And since you have to remember two previous values, it kind of suggests that you're going to have to have four nodes to remember that. Okay, so if somebody assume S0 was uh, the output is one one, will that be wrong? Or Say that again. So if uh, somebody is expected S0 to be one one, Will that be wrong? So the output is one one. So you only so you only have one you only have one output. There's there's one input x and one output z. But you're remembering two previous inputs, and it's the second it's the oldest input that determines what your new output should be. Oh, okay. Yeah, you just you, so one of the things to do is to read the problem multiple times so you really understand it and look at the example sequence so so you know that you're understanding the problem right, thank you yeah it's a good question i think on the test you only you don't have to do that many uh, it, it, i i've kind of de-emphasized this just a little bit and it's more about it's more sm charts 
Okay, extracting this from the state graph into the table is real easy. I mean, from S1, you, you, go, uh, you go here on a zero and you go there on a one. So, so S2, S3. On S3, you stay there on a one, you go back to S2 uh, on a zero. And from S2, you go back to S1 on a one and you go to S0 on a zero. So it's pretty easy to fill that in. You can just look at, at the chart and figure that out. All right, let's, um, so this is, this, this non-sequential counter is very straightforward. So this is one you definitely should, uh, let's see, let me, there'll be a few more people coming in because it's office hours now. I'll let Frank in. Okay, um, so, so here is, um, so, so here's the sequence that you're going to count. Okay, seven, one, three, zero, five, and then back to seven. So since that's your count sequence, then you have to fill in a chart. Missing from this then are two, four, and six. So, so two, four, and six are don't cares. So if you're in zero, you're going to go to five, one, zero, one. If you're in one, you're gonna to go to three, zero, one, one. If you're in two, it's a don't care. Three, you're gonna to go to zero, 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 zero. If you're in five or four, you're going to don't care. If you're in five, then you're going back to seven. And if you're in six, it's a don't care. And if you're in seven, you're going to one. So that gives you your arbitrary sequence. Now you just copy these into these tables. So if I leave out the zeros, and I've already put the x's in for you, one, zero, x, zero, x, one, x, zero. So that's, so you just do this column for A, you do the next one for B, you do this one for C. So B is just uh, zero, one, don't care, zero, and then don't care, one don't care zero and then this is just uh one one don't care zero and don't care one don't care one so so this is easy you just get that and since this is a b c so that's just uh that's just a uh c Let's see, no, that's just, that's, uh, sorry, it's not A because it changes. It's, a, it's just C prime. And this is A. And then this one is uh, these two. So that's just gonna be, uh, so this, so it's not A, A drops. Uh, so it's uh, C prime, uh, sorry, B, B prime C. So that's B prime C. And then this one is going to be uh, this group here. You want to include all four of them. And then this is group. So the, the group of four then is just going to be uh, A, B, C. It's going to be C prime plus this group, which is going to be A, B prime. <coughs> so you just have to read the three variable maps. You just have to remember this. All right, let's look at this quickly. So here's a, here's a SM chart. So you're to draw a state machine chart for a problem with an input X and an output Z where Z equals X, except it must present three, prevent three zeros in a row. If the inputs zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, and the output Z should prevent three zeros in a row. Net resets after the target. Use a immediately machine. Indicate straight binary flip-flop assignment. Okay, so straight binary flip-flop assignment is just gonna be zero, 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 one, one zero and there is no one one so that'll be a don't care sort of okay and then um so now this i didn't label this really correctly i shouldn't have had a block here shouldn't have had a block here shouldn't have had a block oh this one this one should be that one should be there and these don't have to have equal signs you just you just put in the z wherever you see the z that means it equals one where you don't see it it's zero and so so Z is always one here, here. It's, it basically follows X, except in the one case where you have three zeros and then it's also a one. 
and that would be this situation here. You, you've already had two zeros and now you have a third, so Z is one instead of zero. Okay, so you start off in S zero, you have nothing. X comes in and if it's one, then you just stay here because you still have no zeros. But if you get a zero, now you remember one zero and you, but, but you, but you, but Z is still zero because that's okay. You can have one zero, you can have two zeros. You just can't have three zeros in a row. And, and that's where a little bit of an example output sequence would have been helpful. Okay, so now you're here and if you get a zero, now you're gonna go over here and you're gonna, gonna remember that now we have two zeros. We got the first zero here. Now we got the second zero. If you get a one, you're gonna go back here to S zero where you have nothing because you don't, you don't have any zeros. You're only counting zeros. You're not counting ones in this case. And you're only preventing three zeros. You could have three ones, that's fine. All right, so now we're here, we have two zeros. Now if X is a zero, that's three zeros. So now we want Z to be one. So we put Z there, but you also reset because that's what it says. Um, re net resets after target. Okay, so, so then that means we're gonna go back and join in here. It's gonna go all the way around to S zero. And then if Z is a zero, sorry, if Z is a one, if, sorry, if X is a one, then Z is also gonna be a, a one again because it's supposed to be the same as X except for three zeros. So in this case, actually, we, we have to read X in, but we really don't even have to test it. We could actually put our Z link right there and, and get rid of these. And then these both go into the same output. But you do have to read X in, so I guess you need the decision box. Uh, but you don't, you don't, you, no matter what you do, you're, you're going, you, you go back to the beginning on that one. All right, any questions about that one? Uh, let's see, and two people in the waiting room. Pump them in. Okay, we'll put them in. All right, then this one, uh, I tend to ask this one on every test. Um, so, so sequence detector, some variation of it anyway. Network outputs f equals zero unless it sees the sequence one 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 or zero one one, where f equals one. The network resets as soon as the target can't be realized. Um, discarding the value just received, the target is realized. It also resets so the next value starts the next possible target. Draw the state graph for a more network using the partial graph provided. Fill in the state table below. So okay. So basically, we start in S0. We're looking for either 111 or 011. So no matter what our first element is, we're going to go over here to S1. And remember, we have the first item. You can really think of this sequence, the target is X11, sort of a don't care 11. OK, so we get, we get in a value, be it 0 or 1. We still have the first element. Now if we get a 1, now we're going to go down to S2. We'll still output a 0. And we'll go there in a 1. And then if we get another one, we're going to go to S3 and we'll output that one. Now remember for a more, this output has to be associated with the node. So here we output a zero, here we output a zero, here we output a zero. Here we remember that we have nothing. We're in reset. Here we have our first item. Here we have our second. And here we have our third and a target. <clears throat> now, if we get to our first one and we get a zero, but then the next element's a zero, now we're back to having nothing. So we go here on a zero. If we get here and we get, uh, we get, we have, we have uh, X, either a zero and a one, we have our first two items, but we get a zero. Now we're, now we have nothing and we're back to here. And here in S3, we have our target. The next value starts the next item in the next possible sequence. So we don't go back up to here because that would throw that value away. Instead, we go over here on a, on a zero R on a one. All right, and then we just extract that into the state graph. Let me just go through, uh, I don't know, I hope you could, I hope you could see that. Yeah, I think maybe. So yeah, so that's how that looks. I don't know, it may have been off the chart, but so, so this one, you should make sure you think that through and you understand that. Um, oh, let's see. We probably don't, I, I, 
let me do the let me do this one this, i'm not going to ask you one like this you don't have to worry about that anyway okay so here's here's a i will there will be another one of these little diagrams we've been through this a bunch but i'm going to do this one more time and then i'll, I'll cover some more on wednesday uh, i'll do the same thing all right so so you have a clear and it's a jk flip-flop so because there's a clear, is it active high or is it active low? And is our clock rising or falling? Okay, the clock's falling and the clear is active high. So the first thing we do, we mark where the clear is high. Well, here the clear is low and it stays low, goes high, stays high, and then goes back low there. Okay, so here's, here's the active place of the clear. So in these places, it's gonna block that falling edge. But everywhere else, the falling edge is going to be active. All right, but it's not going to be active here because the clear, and and the clear, uh, it goes up here, so, uh, which is, which is actually right here. But there's still going to be a small delay before it takes effect. All right, now you start off. Remember that a JK flip flop. You just have to remember a couple of things. Both zero, it holds. Zero, one, it resets. One, zero, it sets. And one, one, it toggles. That's all you have to remember. It's very straightforward. Okay, so now, so now let's think, let's do the little di diagram. So at this active edge, we have J is one and K is one. At this active edge, we have K is one and J is zero, because it just misses it. At this active edge, J is one and K is one. These don't count. And finally, at this active edge, J is zero and K is one. All right, so when they're both one, what's Q gonna do? It starts off at zero and, it, and we have a five nanosecond delay from the active, so, so, so here's our edge right here. Five nanoseconds later, we're here. They're both one, so it's gonna to toggle. So it's gonna to go up to one. Now it's gonna stay there until at least this point here, five nanoseconds after the next edge. Now J is, uh, J is zero and K is one. So that means it's it, here. So five nanoseconds later, it's going to it's going to reset because j is 0 and k is 1 now it's going to stay down there here they're both 1 so it's going to toggle again but it'll do it 5 nanoseconds later so we'll go up here now it's going to stay up here until it gets to the asynchronous input which is a clear so it's still that takes a 5 nanosecond delay so then that comes down there and then it's going to stay clear and as long as that's asserted it can't do anything else and finally on this last one it's going to it's it's going to reset anyway so it'll just stay clear going out so that's what that's what your tracing should look like okay i think with that i'll quit i'll, I'll do some more on wednesday i will post this video uh, any last minute questions and then we'll transition to to the uh to the help time and I'm going to, I think I'm stuck, unless there's questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. All right. And then let me stop the share and then I'll stop the video.